Uh, welcome, everyone. I am very happy to introduce you uh, Mauricio Gomez Gonzalez. Most of you know him. He started, uh, he's been a postdoc for the past two years. Um, Mauricio studied his undergrad, uh, his bachelor, he got his bachelor degree from the Universidad de Guadalajara. And then he studied the master and got his PhD at Inaoe, working under the supervision of Tibacara Maya. And then he had a position in Chiapas and then he started working with us in 2019, if I'm not sure. Yeah, March 2019. And he just finished uh, his two year postdoc working with us in, in uh, early this year. He's been working with us. Uh, he had a very uh, prolific uh, few years. He, he worked in several projects, which he achieved and finished most of them. Um, today, he's going to talk to us about uh, uh, Wolf Rayet uh, stars in the Antenna Galaxy. So, thank you, Mauricio. Um, thank you, Jesus, for the introduction. So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Sundar and Vicente, for the invitation. Uh, it is my pleasure to talk uh, about my recent work uh, on the search for extragalactic world ray stars, in particular, the case of the antenna galaxies. Um, that you can see here, yes, here. So my collaborators in this work are Diva Karamaya from Inaue, Jesus Tuala, and Jen Arthur from Iria, with whom I just finish uh, my postdoc that I really enjoyed. And also Javier Zaragoza from Minaue and Martin Guerrero from Spain. So just to break the ice, uh, let me start by defining what is a world ready star. And first of all, a brief uh, historical background. Uh, these stars uh, take their very attractive name from French astronomers Charles Wolf <coughs> and George Rayet, who discovered them at the Paris Observatory back in the year 1867. Uh, this is a very telescope, a Foucault 40 centimeter in diameter, with which the first three world stars were found in the constellation of Cygnus. As you see, uh, more than 150 years have passed since its discovery. However, uh, nowadays the world rayet phenomenon is still being investigated and very active. Interestingly, none of the more than 600 world rayet stars observed so far in our in our Milky Way uh, in our galaxy and also in the neither in the small and uh, large Magellanic clouds have exploded at, as a supernova and this is intriguing. So in the literature uh, you can find basically two scenarios competing to answer the question what is the nature of the worry stars. <clears throat> the first scenario on your left was originally proposed by Peter Conti in 1976 and claims that the world ray stars represent the final stage in the evolution of massive stars. We are speaking of masses in the main sequence, say greater than 25 solar masses, this at solar uh, metallicity, and uh, the, do the dominant nuclear reactions in massive stars, as you know, are the CNO cycle and the triple alpha process, which are much more efficient than, for example, the proton-proton chain in long mass stars. And this is why they are very, uh, young stars uh, with ages of around two to four uh, mega years. Uh, however, uh, the worried phase accounts for only 10% uh, of the star's lifetime. We are speaking of 200 or to 400,000 uh, years, uh, which is uh, a really very short on astronomical uh, time scales and, and hence uh, its rarity in finding it. So the worried phase is characterized by significant mass loss rates of 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus five solar masses per year through strong stellar winds, uh, red, relatively uh, driven uh, with speeds of 10 to the three kilometers per second, which are expected to inject <clears throat> mechanical energy, ionizing photons and new metals into the local interstellar uh, medium. So in short, in this scenario, a no-type star before exploding as a supernova goes through the worried phase, which is divided into several uh, stages. First, a nitrogen rich and then a carbon or oxygen rich, and its mass will determine which phases it passes through. And each one is divided into a late and early types, which are related to the degree of ionization. 
basically an early stage is harder than a later. In the second scenario uh, on your right is uh, very different. Uh, this proposes that the star, uh, that the world radiate phase is a result of, of the star that is losing its outermost uh, layers, is peeling like, like an onion, and not by winds, but by mass transfer from a star to its companion. And this happens in a binary or multiple system. But uh, you may ask, uh, uh, how much should we consider this scenario? Well, the observational evidence indicates that 100% of massive stars are binary. Of these, uh, seven, uh, around 70% uh, will be in interaction. Uh, in recent works by Eldridge in 2017 and uh, 2020, uh, try to reproduce uh, the observations with their BPAS uh, models, assuming a distribution of periods and, and mass ratios. So basically, uh, the evolution of a binary system cannot be understood as a sum of the evolution of two stars evolving in isolation. In fact, uh, it is very different. In order to see this, uh, let's consider a system made of two massive stars, one of 20 solar masses and the other of eight solar masses. Uh, you can see this on this video and the cartoon on, on your right. Initially, uh, both stars are in the main sequence, uh, the vertical line uh, here uh, represents uh, the center of mass and the contours, the gravitational equipotential, which is better known as the Roch law. Uh, later, uh, the most massive star is expected to evolve faster than its companion, increases in size, fills its, its Roch law, and mass transfer begins to, to its less massive partner. And thus, the star uh, gradually loses its outermost layers leaving more internal and therefore harder layers exposed, which are capable of ionize the elements that we see in a typical world radiate spectrum. And later, uh, the helium star explodes as a supernova and a compact object of around two solar masses uh, remains. And now the star that was initially the, the less massive is now the most massive and will eventually fill its Roche law, may transfer mass to the compact object, become a helium star and also explodes as a supernova, as you watch in the video. So in the end, uh, there are the remnants of both stars, uh, two compact objects, which can be neutron stars or black holes, uh, depending on their initial masses. And they may or may not be uh, gravitationally bound. And here is where the connection with the gravitational uh, waves, but this is another topic. <laughs> So in this hertzsprung russell diagram of luminosity uh, versus temperature, uh, you see in black the traces for stars of 10, 20, and 40 solar masses. The single scenario, uh, in the single scenario, only those stars more massive than 25 solar masses go uh, through the Borrelli phase. On the other hand, uh, the binary models uh, are shown in color traces uh, for the same masses. And in this scenario, note that the low mass stars also go through the war rate phase, as you can see uh, here. Uh, so the evolutionary paths of binaries are very different from, from those of, of a star that evolves in isolation. And yet, uh, for a long time, they have been uh, practically ignored by the community. It must, be, it must be said that for reasons of theoretical complexity and computational power. So this is just one case of the differences that are expected between both scenarios. Uh, you can see more examples in, in this reference in Eldridge uh, 2020. Of course, uh, that this discussion is very active today. And, but in summary, uh, I can say that there is one scenario proposing that Wolverine well stars are descendants of massive stars higher than 25 solar masses. And the second, that they are the result of the evolution of a binary or multiple system and not necessarily uh, that massive. So the point here is that both scenarios involve very different astrophysical phenomena. And uh, we can test uh, which of, of, of those uh, scenarios is happening observationally, uh, as I will show you in, in the antenna. <clears throat> so until now, uh, the only way to find water ray stars is through its spectrum. And here I show you maybe not the best spectrum, but it's my favorite uh, since 
it was the first uh, World Riot Stars uh, star that we discovered in my team at Inaue, in my PhD. So it is a, this is World Riot 1 in the galaxy MD1, which is located at a distance of 3.6 megaparsec. And this is the optical spectrum uh, taken at the Gran Telescopio Canarias, GTC, with the OSIRIS instrument. And you can see uh, the range in wavelength from 3,700 to 7,500 angstroms in the optical. And you can see also emission lines of hydrogen, helium, oxygen, sulfur, etc., cetera, uh, from the environment. The ones I want you to focus are these broad lines, uh, known as wall rayet bombs. Uh, the blue bone uh, of, on, the, on the left, uh, towards the blue, uh, and the red bomb to the right, uh, towards the red. So the blue bomb is for mainly by, by broad lines of helium-2 at 4686 uh, angstroms. And it can also have a nitrogen-3 to nitrogen-5 or carbon-3 to carbon-4. And these elements are the products of hydrogen burning through the CNO cycle. And when only this bomb is observed, is, it is attributed to nitrogen-rich WON types. On the other hand, uh, the red bomb uh, is made up of carbon-4, 5806 angstroms, which is a product of helium burning uh, through the triple, triple alpha process. And when this bomb is also observed, it is attributed to WC types, that is carbon-rich uh, warring stars. Uh, here in the in the upper right, I show you an image uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope, the HST, uh, from the star forming region where where this spectrum was taken. The wall rayet is indicated in the center of the image uh, with, with the red circle, and the size of the aperture pro, from which its spectrum was extracted was uh, one arc second, uh, which at the distance of MD1 is a. Uh, uh, that is a 3.6 uh, megaparsecs, uh, corresponds to 18 parsecs. So this is a large size, as you can see. So the spectrum has information not only from the world ray star, but also from its, from its nebular environment. So the nebular lines uh, that, that you see in the spectrum correspond uh, to this environment. However, the, the broad lines uh, can only be a product of the central world ray star. So in this work, uh, we discovered uh, the first 14 Wolverine we stars, the first population actually in MD1 that I show you here, and each uh, with a very complex and stellar ne ne and nebular environment. And here you can see the locations indicated by circles of different colors, indicating different observing uh, seasons of the 21 Wolverine stars that, that we have found so far in MD1. In fact, uh, they are all uh, in, in the spiral arms, uh, which is to be expected in this galaxy, whose most uh, recent uh, star formation is right there. So analyzing uh, the spectra, uh, the spectral components of the so-called <coughs> uh, one bombs, we found uh, some interesting relations. For example, in, the, in this uh, four panel uh, diagram, in, uh, the x-axis goes from one to 21, which corresponds to the ID of the Borayet. And uh, the y-axis <coughs> for the first panel corresponds to the total luminosity, the luminosity of the blue bomb, that is helium-2, uh, plus the luminosity of the red bomb, uh, carbon-4. So notice how this increases uh, as the luminosity uh, of the wall uh, rayet is in a more advanced evolutionary state, which goes from from WNL to WNE in a transitional WC over N uh, to carbon uh, rich. In the second panel, uh, the luminosity of helium-2 is more important in the WN phase. Uh, the third panel indicates the luminosity of nitrogen. And in the last panel uh, shows the luminosity of carbon, <coughs> which as expected, increases in the in the worry in the WC uh, phase. So uh, between the second and the fourth uh, panels, you can see like an anticorrelation between the luminosity of helium and that of the carbon uh, four. As helium one, uh, helium two decreases, uh, carbon increases. So another interesting relation is shown in this diagram of luminosity of red bomb versus the luminosity of the blue bomb. Here, the 21 points corresponds to individual uh, wall stars 
except for number three and number six uh, indicated in green, which are multiple uh, world ray stars. So here the color indicates the world ray type. Uh, thus, uh, purple indicates a type WNE, that is early uh, nitrogen type, a uh, blue WNL, uh, late nitrogen, and orange is a transitional phase between uh, the WCs and the WNs. And the red uh, indicate, uh, indicates a WCE. So we obtained this classification independently using templates of individual world ray stars observed uh, in the Large Magellanic Cloud uh, with a metallicity similar to MD1. So in this diagram, uh, the, the trending luminosity of the world of the world rayets is very clear, uh, which increases in, in both axes with the evolutionary state. And the details of this work ca can be found in Gomez Gonzalez 2020. So at this point, um, uh, I open a brief parenthesis just to say that the world ray phenomenon is not exclusive to massive stars, that is higher than 25 solar masses in, in the main sequence. It also occurs in low and intermediate mass stars between two and eight solar masses. Here I show you the case of NGC 2371, which is a planetary nebula whose uh, central star reaches temperatures of up to 130 uh, kilokelvins. Uh, I've been doing this, uh, these uh, studies in, 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 with my team at IRIA and other institutions. So uh, also uh, NGC 6905, uh, which is also very hot and capable of ionize the elements that we see in, in the world rate uh, spectrum. Here you can see the famous uh, world rate bombs. And something that clearly uh, differenti differentiates them from massive worry stars is the luminosity and the rate mass and, and the rate of mass loss, which in planetary nebula uh, uh, is uh, several orders of magnitude smaller. And these planetary nebula um, war rates are, are uh, indicated by, by these uh, brackets. So we now turn to the object that I want to talk to you about this time, which is, which is a NGC 4038 and 39, very known as the antenna galaxies, uh, where we have conducted a search for extragalactic world ray stars. In general, I can mention that the antenna is the closest and youngest pair of galaxies in, in, in a collision process. To the north uh, is the largest NGC 4038, and to the south, the smaller uh, spiral NGC 4039. An antenna is at a distance of 18.1 megaparsec. Uh, as you can see, even with the naked eye, uh, it contains a large number of star forming in each uh, and in Gian H2 regions. An antenna is a very well studied object. There are a lot of multi wavelength uh, works in this object from radio and infrared. Here I'll show you an image from Spitzer to the ultraviolet and X-rays. Here I'll show you an image from Chandra. And this is an image composed of the three bands. So it is well known that most of the star formation occurs in associations or groups uh, once embedded in GM molecular clouds. An antenna is rich in all of this. So. Now you see uh, why to look for young stars here. So uh, the, uh, the observational evidence uh, indicates that the star formation increases uh, significantly in galaxies that are in an interaction or collision uh, process. And this happens precisely in antenna. So it is an ideal object to study uh, stel uh, stellar formation and evolution here. In particular, uh, young massive stars, uh, which are the progenitors of the Warrior stars, so another interesting aspect uh, that is worth uh, highlighting is that uh, these uh, superstar clusters uh, can become as compact and massive as globular clusters. In fact, uh, the most compact and massive of, of these uh, are expected to survive uh, disruptive processes uh, that can disperse uh, the cluster. And there is a whole list of these processes, but if they survive for a whole time, uh, say some giga years, and then they will be the progenitors 
of the globular clusters that, uh, that we see uh, today. Uh, however, uh, to give you an idea of the type of objects that you see in this image of antenna, here is an image of the super star cluster best known for its proximity, which is 30 Dorados in, in the LMC. This contains a compact uh, cluster in the center, surrounded by an extended uh, cluster that in turn is part of a cluster of clusters uh, known as Tarantula. And the brightest uh, regions in antenna corresponds not to individual superclusters, but to complexes of superstar clusters. So uh, for our study, uh, we used archival observations from the Very Large Telescope, the VLT, taken with the Multi-Unit Spectroscopic Explorer, uh, the MUSE instrument. And you can see here a lot of fields that have been observed in, in antenna with MUSE. And we use uh, four of these uh, fields that span the two galaxies, in particular their disk and their spiral arms. And in this table that I do not intend uh, for you to read, I describe some aspects uh, of the observations. Uh, I can highlight the fields of view of about uh, two art minutes and the exposure times of in each field of uh, 5,400 uh, seconds, which is one hour and a half uh, for the four, in the four out of to six hours. So for the first search, uh, taking advantage of the spectral range in the coops, uh, Images were obtained uh, simulating narrow filters in the blue bomb, helium 24686, the continuum of the, of the blue bomb in the H alpha bands. And with this method, most of the broad helium 2 emitters, uh, the, which are the fingerprint of the ball radius stars, uh, were found. Subsequently, an exhaustive search uh, was carried, uh, carried out by, by eye, uh, so as not to rule out any area that could also contain helium 2 and we were missing with the, with the filter technique. So we, uh, in this way, we add uh, uh, some extra regions. And <clears throat> here I show you uh, the spectrum of World Riot 1 in antenna. It is called World Riot 1 because it was the first one that I, <laughs> that I found, but it, but it is also the one with the most intense uh, World Riot lines. Uh, you can see uh, the spectral range from 4,600 angstroms to 9,300 angstroms. Here, the flux is uh, shown normalized to the, to the best fitted continuum. And very intense lines uh, stand out. Uh, you can see hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, <clears throat> which are necessary to determine the physical parameters of the nebular environment uh, where these boreal stars are located. And the war rayet bombs, uh, the famous blue bomb and the red bomb, uh, see how weak they look compared to the other lines. I will show you a zoom of these lines uh, la later. <clears throat> so this is how we found uh, 38 regions with war uh, presence, and which I show you in this image, uh, composed of HST filters. And the 38 areas uh, with war ray stars are indicated uh, with red circles, you can appreciate uh, that they are in the spiral arms. And, and right on the bridge between the two galaxies. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, the area with the most intense uh, lines is four right one. And now we will see what, what this implies. And the rectangles are uh, regions where with more at all in 2010 obtained the extinction uh, using color color diagrams by using optical and ultraviolet images. And we can take, we take advantage of these values uh, to the redden our spectra. So this is a funny uh, one. Uh, at first we thought that we saw the, the blue bomb uh, in this spectrum, but it turned out to be a red-chipped oxygen uh, line. Here you can see other very intense and broad lines that corresponds uh, to hydrogen and oxygen <laughs> at the rate of 0 0.264. So people from media working on AGNs uh, will agree with me that it corresponds to a probable quasar. So the only lines here that corresponds uh, to antenna are indicated uh, below, below the spectrum. And this will be a case of a, of a false uh, wolf ray. So we, we must be very careful to not to automa automatize all the, all the process and see by eye each, each, each of the spectrum. So we use observational templates available from Professor Paul Crother, uh, uh, 
personal web page of individual uh, world ray stars uh, observed in the uh, in our galaxy, which are ideal for the antenna given its solar uh, metallicity, and considering that, that it, it doesn't have a metallicity gradient. So here you can see the observed spectrum in, in black uh, with its, its best template in blue. We want to fit here only the bumps, uh, not the continuum. And we do it simultaneously for both bumps. And for this spectrum, it was necessary to combine 400 uh, nitrogen war rate stars and 400 carbon war rate stars. So uh, it gives a total of 800 war rate stars uh, just in, in this, in this uh, region. So we did this uh, for our 38 uh, war rate uh, regions. Here I'll show you some of the spectra in the frequency. And here I show you a table uh, with some of our results. Of course, I don't pretend you to read it. Uh, basically, we count the stars of each type in each of the 38 regions, and soon they give a total of 4,000 world ray stars, out of which 2,000 uh, are WNLs, nitrogen rich, and 2,000 correspond to WC types, carbon rich. And the ratio between WC to WN is an important parameter to be determined as there are models that predict different values in a scenario of individual evolution and of massive star, uh, of, of, of a binary uh, system. So we, with the ionizing photons from the H beta line, the O-type stars uh, were also estimated in, in the regions where we discovered the, the worry stars. In the last column, you can see the sizes of, of these clusters uh, from about 100 to uh, 350 parsecs. And uh, at these distances, uh, uh, the dozens of megaparsecs, individual stars are not found. So uh, you, you, can, you can only see star cluster complexes of this type of stars. So there are other oxygen rich uh, ray stars, uh, WO types that we were unable to search in our 38 uh, regions in antenna, given uh, the spectral range of MUSE. Uh, the fingerprint of the, of the, uh, of the WO type uh, stars is the oxy oxygen 6 at 38, uh, 20 angstroms that you can see we don't have it uh, with MUSE. Uh, however, uh, th this spectral range is covered by OCDs uh, at the Gran Telescopio Canarias, and so looking for public observations, uh, reducing and analyzing the spectra, uh, we did not find uh, the world rayet bomb of the WO types, uh, at least for world rayet one, uh, which is the supercluster with the highest number of world rayet stars in the antenna. And I will not expect uh, to find uh, in other regions either, uh, but it would be, of course, uh, necessary to look for them. And unfortunately, I, I got uh, this spectrum uh, from a long slit uh, that only observed uh, this object. And some of the master students from media, uh, Gris, uh, Osmar, and Ruben, may remember uh, this spectrum uh, as this war rate was uh, serendipitously discovered uh, when I was preparing the, their first class of the multi wavelength astronomy course. So they are part of this story. And we also did a multi-Gaussian decomposition of the war rate bombs uh, to quantify and report the luminosities, intensities, full width, hull maximums, equivalent width, etc. In case you don't trust in the observational templates, uh, the, the numbers are consistent. So this was done uh, for all the spectra. Here I show you just some of, 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 the, of the fittings. You can see, for example, uh, in, in, the, in the fittings, uh, 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 the broad lines in blue and nebular lines that corresponds to the environment in, in red. And here you can see how much of, uh, of uh, each of the warrior components contribute to the total luminosity of the bomb. Uh, in the first uh, panel, uh, in the so-called blue bomb, uh, it is helium-2 that dominates in general follow with uh, by nitrogen and carbon. And in the second panel uh, the, of the red bomb, it is carbon for uh, the line that dominates this bomb. In this table that 
uh, I, I did not pretend you to read. Uh, I show you uh, uh, the rest of the results, which list uh, the most important parameters of, of each line. Uh, here we also measure the, the nebula lines, uh, not properly of the star, but of the nebular environment, uh, with which uh, we obtain some physical parameters, uh, such as the electronic and uh, temperature and uh, densities, and also some kinematic information that for the antenna is not new, but it confirms uh, previous results by Nate Bastian and others. And what we uh, wanted to determine uh, was the oxygen abundance for, for our more rigid regions. And we found that they are above solar. And here I show you uh, some interesting relations that we obtained thanks to the multi gaussian fittings of, of the lines. Uh, the luminosity of the red bomb versus the luminosity of the blue bomb is plotted uh, on the left. And the 38 uh, world rated regions are shown here. Uh, in red is uh, world rated one uh, uh, highlighted, uh, which is a comp uh, complex uh, with uh, the most intense world rated lines and therefore the highest number of world rated stars uh, with 800 world rated stars actually. And on the right, I show you the luminosity of H beta versus the luminosity of the blue bomb. Uh, they follow an ascending trend. Uh, an interesting thing about this plot is that the luminosity of H beta uh, is related to the population of all type stars. And you clearly see that the greater the number of all type stars, the greater the number of world ray stars, uh, which is to be expected if we consider that the world ray stars are descendants of all type stars. And here also, uh, World Rayet 1 uh, has the highest uh, flux in H beta. So it has the highest number of World Rayet stars and the highest number of all type stars. And the same happens if we plot uh, not the luminosities, but their equivalent widths. Uh, and here, the blue horizontal line indicates uh, 50 angstroms, uh, which, according to, to the models, it is expected that. The points above this value uh, correspond to uh, to edges uh, for sure are younger than four mega years. And here I show you uh, the ratio of WC over WN, uh, carbon over nitrogen, and also a uh, war rayet uh, over all type stars uh, ratios versus the oxygen abundance. And here, uh, the values of the Magellanic clouds, the small Magellanic cloud, the large Magellanic cloud in the Milky Way. Uh, so you can see in context uh, the value of antenna. And in red and blue, uh, what the BPAS models predict for single and binary scenario. So you can see uh, that the world, that the world rate population uh, for the antenna is consistent with the single evolution scenario in general, which is consistent uh, uh, with the predictions that uh, it is more important uh, at high metallicity and the binary population may be more, uh, more important uh, at low metallicities. On the, on the right, I, I put an, uh, an upper limit of the world rayet over all type uh, ratio because only the all type stars uh, for the regions with world rayet stars uh, were counted. If those all type stars of the entire galaxy uh, were counted, the global ratio of this value is expected to decrease because the, the uh, all type stars are in the denominator. And if this increases, uh, this value is smaller. So this is an upper limit. So uh, just to take home, uh, we found uh, 4,000 worried stars in the antenna. Uh, we reported the number, the classification, and their distribution. Uh, we found 2,000 world rate stars of so, uh, WNLs, uh, nitrogen type, and 2,000 WC types, uh, which gives a WC over WN ratio of 1, uh, which is consistent uh, with the models of a single evolution. And uh, this is a first work of its kind at Antenna. And for now, we have significantly increased the number of extragalactic world rate stars and therefore supernova progenitors and other exotic uh, objects. 
And finally, uh, the worry phenomena alone is, is interesting enough to, uh, to, to study. However, they are uh, also very interesting for other areas, since so far uh, they, they are the best candidates for uh, to be the, the, proge the progenitors of uh, supernova, uh, core collapse supernova 1BC, because they don't have uh, neither hydrogen or helium in the, in the, in the atmosphere, so they, they must uh, uh, lost uh, the, 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 the photosphere in some way, and the, the world ray channel is, is one of these uh, scenarios. And also the soft uh, long duration gamma ray bursts and, the, and even the, the gravitational uh, waves. But this is uh, another, for, for another uh, presentation. So uh, now you, you know how many world ray stars are in this portrait at the entrance of, of FIDIA. And remember this when you return to normal activities, uh, hopefully uh, very soon. And that's all I wanted to, to say to you uh, today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mauricio. Thank you so much. OK, uh, let's see some hands for questions. Ah, okay. Roberto, go ahead. Uh, gracias, Mauricio. Hola, profesor. ¿Qué tal? A lo mejor alguien no habla en español. Eh, we proceed in English. Yeah, okay, yes. Uh, uh, one question uh, in relation with this very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, one of the aspects uh, that are uh, also important is the, the sort of environment in which this work are evolving. And my question is, have you put these, uh, uh, these systems into a diagnostic diagram to see what they fit in relation with the, with the uh, normal uh, uh, star forming regions? No, I haven't yet, but it's, it is a good point. You mean in the in a BPT uh, diagram? I, I didn't want to say BPT, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, okay, but, but we will do it, yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, because looking at the spectra you, you were showing, uh, on, uh, although it's in logarithmic scale, the, the intensity, it looks to me that nitrogen too is... is uh, about the factor of two less than H alpha, but oxygen three is stronger than H beta. And that will put these systems into the, not the, really the CIFR area, but the transition between, uh, between star forming and, and CIFRs. If this is a typical spectrum of one of these superstellar clusters with all right yet in the antenna. Okay, it, it, it will be uh, very interesting to, to explore uh, that. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I will relay a question from Aida. She's not turning on her microphone because of background noise. So Aida's question is, she says, do you think that main sequence wolf stars contribute a lot to uh, the broad helium-2 emission? Uh, yes, uh, that's what what we uh, think is happening here. Uh, the the helium two, uh, which is a uh, broad, we don't have contribution of a uh, nebular helium two. Uh, I must say that uh, we only have uh, the broad helium two. So it is uh, we are assuming that uh, this uh, broad line uh, is all is for uh, mainly from the from the warrior stars and and in particular. Well, uh, something that I'm questioning um, is if which kind of stars uh, contribute more to the helium to the WN the WNs of the WCs. But but yes, we, we are assuming that this broad line is uh, for only for the for the world ray stars it, because you, you can see here that it, it is a uh, broad. So uh, she says she's not asking about classical Conti. Uh, wolf ray stars, but uh, which are helium burning, but she's asking about the main sequence wolf ray stars. Mm. Mm. Well, 
uh, maybe I, I don't understand. Uh, w N H, she says. Ah, H. Well, yes. Well, we don't have a hydrogen in in absorption, so maybe the these uh, stars uh, do, do not contribute to to a spectra. Yeah. But still, W N H they have very low effective temperatures. They wouldn't contribute significantly to the ionization of anything. And so it, those are like Wolfram 40, Wolfram 16, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Aida, was that satisfactory? Um, yeah, we can talk about it later because I really have very <laughs> strong background noise here. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. So the next question is from uh, Rosa. Yes. Hi. Hi, Mauricio. Thank Hi, you. Rosa. Very nice talk. Um, I don't know anything about this. So I was just speculating whether the fact that most um, wolf rayets in the antenna are single is related more to the star formation rate, which is much higher there than in all the other galaxies you mentioned, than to the metallicity. Well, I suppose that it is because of the of the metallicity. Yeah, here is here the uh, here the, the the models. Yes, because the um, uh, the higher the metallicity, uh, the higher the opacity, and the the, the winds is uh, driven by uh, is relatively uh, driven. So, so we expect that the the single evolution channel is. Is, is the most important in, in the higher metallicity environments. And the binary channel is maybe more, 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 more important in at, at low metallicities, like maybe like the, the Magellanic clouds and other objects that Aida is expert. <laughs> yes. Yes, but with the higher star, uh, star formation rate, you also expect to have more high metallicity stars. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's something uh, that I, I don't know, but uh, it is also very interesting. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Well, I will ask a dumb question. Uh, so I, I might have missed that part of the talk where you may have mentioned this, but I was wondering. Um, so with the continuum subtraction and then, so I, I, in none of the spectra did I see any uncertainties, measurement uncertainties. So how would the measurement uncertainties and the uncertainty in the continuum subtraction affect your results? There was no, uh, uh, maybe you mentioned it, right? Um, okay. Yes. Perfect. All right. Never mind. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Can I, can I expand what Rosa was saying? Uh, because I was thinking that, so Rosa is saying that it's probably because of metallicity, but I, correct me, Mauricio, if I'm wrong. No, the metallicity no, I'm, saying of, that, I'm saying that it's because of the star formation rate, that you would have more very high uh, yeah. okay. stars. Yeah, I still don't know. The, the models, uh, yeah, that was connected to what, uh, uh, Roberto Terlevich was saying that I, I wanted to ask, I because I ignore it, and maybe my audience too. Where would you find this this interactive galaxies that are not regular or not extreme things in the PPT diagrams, for example? Um, uh, Roberto Terlevich can can <laughs> can answer this this question. Puede repetir la pregunta. Yeah. yeah, so you mentioned that if we have explored the, the properties of the uh, ionized guys in these uh, ionization diagrams, but where, where do you expect these interactive galaxies to be? I, I, I ignored this completely. So where do you expect this to be? In the middle region or in regular galaxies or? Well, there are two things here. There are the galaxies and there are the other regions of star formation. Uh, uh, this talk in relation with the, with the antenna and the other refers to the superstellar clusters, not to the galaxy. 
So these are individual or groups or clusters of superstellar clusters and uh, are not the whole galaxy. The whole galaxy of these two galaxies that are interacting, they have their properties and the abundances and the probably abundance uh, gradients. But here the study refers to the superstellar clusters. And so the properties are the properties of superstellar clusters. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then each of them will have its age to region. And we are very interested after seeing the spectrum that uh, is that uh, they look, they don't look like uh, 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 the line ratios that are typical of a, of a normal star forming region without whole ray. And that's consistent with the evolutionary tracks that they were shown that this, this world riot, when they go into the world riot stage, they become hotter. Therefore, uh, uh, they alter the ionizing spectrum and, and uh, in a way that they, they tend to move towards the AGN part of the BPT diagram. So I will be very interested to see uh, how this where these systems fall uh, into into the BPT diagram, but these are individual clusters and not galaxies. Yes, we we will do that. We I I, I we, we we measure all the lines, so it's just a question of plot <laughs> these lines <laughs> here, the nitrogen, and all the other lines. So yes, thank you, Professor Terwich. So sorry, I, I missed this, but uh, Aida had a question. She said, uh, do you see a trend of uh, full width half max of HE2 versus radius? Does it increase by any chance? Uh, full width half maximum versus what? Uh, uh, the full width half max of HE2 versus uh, radius. The, the radius of the of the object, radius? Yes. Ah, the size, OK. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry. No, the, the distance from the center, like the square ah, limit. Yeah. A metallistic gradient, and so the pull with yeah, max is sensitive well, to metallicity. We will have to, uh, to to explore that because, we, of course, we, we determine the, the oxygen abundance for each of the of the star forming uh, regions. As the, as Professor Teller uh, just mentioned, they are uh, uh, independent uh, regions of star formation. But we, we we wanted to to do like a like a plot of. of that kind of uh, something versus uh, galactosentic uh, radius, but it uh, we, we wasn't uh, so sure to do that because it is like two galaxies in interaction, so we don't know <laughs> like uh, if this is uh, something that we must do. For example, this this object, World Riot One, which has the highest number of orbiting stars, uh, uh, in respect to to, to 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 the first galactosentic radius or to, to this one, or I, I don't know. Um, if uh, in people don't do this, uh, uh, this kind of studies versus galactic red, red so, interactive so since, galaxies, but it's, 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 so since Aida was asking about, uh, the, uh, uh, this in the sense of, uh, versus a metallistic gradient, either, uh, would it work if uh, it was just plotted versus metallicity of the region? Yes. And I'm maybe, saying it because I, I noticed, sorry, I noticed that one of your objects has a full width half max that's less than a thousand. So that's unusual for a wolf ray. So do you have an object that's like 600 kilometers per second, the one that has full width half max of nine, that number four there? Okay. Um, you, 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 no, in helium two, in helium two. In helium two? Uh, here. Uh, here. Yeah, the number four has a full width of max of nine angstroms, right? That is like like six hundred kilometers per second. <laughs> you know where that is? That that region? Mm. Oh, well, this region is. Uh, it's next to number number one, yes. <laughs> it was zero four, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, we will have to explore more uh, this, this data. <laughs> All right, thank you. It, your talk was beautiful. Thank you, Aida. Okay, yes. Um, 
it was a very interesting talk and uh, you have lots of wonderful data to go ahead and explore many more things with so thank, uh, you, so thank you very much for uh, giving us a description of your work and uh, so yeah uh, thank you very much let's thank the speaker again gracias mauricio gracias a ustedes <laughs> I will send you a, uh, an email to ask for a PDF of your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a good afternoon.